The passage we're looking at this morning in Joshua, the first chapter, is actually the second time that God is calling his people to go into a promised land. And the first time couldn't have gone worse. It was an epic display of failure at levels it's hard to describe. And our assumption would be is when you fail that magnificently that God has nothing more to say. It's simply not true. How the original event occurred was uh, Moses had led the children of Israel out of Egypt where they had been enslaved through the wilderness until they got to the place where they were ready to enter the promised land. And, and just before they were to go in, he sent 12 individuals, men, who were well known and had good reputation to gather some information. They wanted to know if the people were strong or weak. They wanted to know if the cities were fortified and walled or if they were undefended. They wanted to know if the soil was fertile or if it was poor. They wanted to know what kind of fruit was there and if there were trees there. And they were to bring all this information back and all 12 came back agreeing on this point and that is it is a phenomenal place. It is more fruitful than anything we've ever seen or witnessed in our lives. It is unbelievably good. And they brought some of the fruit back and people were so impressed at just how incredibly productive this place was. But they didn't agree on the second half of the report. The second half of the report was whether they were able to go up and inhabit such a place as this. And 10 of the 12 said, it's not possible for us. We're not strong enough. We're not, we don't have enough military. We're going to be prey to the people who will attack us from the fortified cities that are there. We will not survive this event. There were two individuals who thought differently. Their names were Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb thought that they were able to do this and that God would be with them and that it would be all right. And so they, they encouraged everyone to go forward. But whatever the system was of how they de determined the, the, the mindset of the nation of Israel at that time, uh, the vote was cast and Joshua and Caleb did not prevail. Uh, the majority decided we are not going in. And it was a devastating loss. And so for the next 40 years, the nation of Israel would wander. Now this is fascinating to me. Clearly it was God's will that they would go into the promised land at that moment. And yet people were unwilling to do so. And so for the next 40 years, they wandered. And God still provided for them in their wandering every single day. Some people say, you know, God is too judgmental, and especially the Old Testament God. This is a group of people who they refused to be obedient to what God called them to do and the opportunity he provided. And when they decided to wander instead... He still provided for them so that they had food and water every day. And on top of that, he waited. He actually waited for that entire generation who were 40 years old and older to die. And they all did eventually. It took a while. It took another 40 years. And uh, they all did die. But God could have just sent lightning from heaven and, and targeted everyone who was over 40. How many of that would bother you today? Some of you are in denial, and I can tell. Um, but God was faithful. And now we've come through that 40 years, and Moses has actually died, also part of that generation. And Joshua is told by God he's going to be the next leader. And uh, this is not going to be an easy assignment. Because Joshua has lost his leader. And Joshua remembers the last time he tried to encourage people to do something like go into this land. And God is giving him a second chance. Why would God give him a chance to try again? Why would God ask him to try again? That's a very important question for us because I think there are times when God asks us to try again. This passage is really important. It says... God is speaking to Joshua and he says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. 
Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. How many have noticed the theme that God keeps saying? Be strong. Be courageous. Because when you're afraid to try again, these words matter. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Why shouldn't we just accept that our previous effort was not good enough? Why should we try again? I think there's some good reasons for that. And the first is, so we're not defined by our failure. Because if every time you fail, that's the last time you try, then the only thing we can attach to you is your failure. And God simply refuses to leave us defined by what we failed at. He intends for us to be able to move on. So our frustration and our anxiety that gets attached with the things that we feel we failed at, when we have another opportunity, you'll feel those emotions. It's almost like a mild form of PTSD. The frustration and the anxiety begin to rise again. But here's what God wants us to know, just like he wanted Joshua to know, and that is God is not done with you. Your last failure was not his last activity in your life. Another reason to move on is so you can move forward. So you can move forward. It's amazing how many of us stay trapped in the past. A past failure or a past situation kind of dominates all of our decision making. In fact, there's a lot of people who they, they identify something that is terrible in their life right now and they connect it to a previous failure in their life. And that's why I'm experiencing this right now. And it's like a, a little horror book of connect the dots, you know, where this is what's wrong and that is the reason why. And God wants us to know that he want, doesn't want us to stay stuck in the past. He wants us to move forward. And so we won't waste opportunities. That God actually creates opportunities for us in the present that can, be a, that can provide a remarkable future. And if we're making all of our decisions based on the past, we won't enter in any of them. God actually intends that the painful and hard things we have been through in our life can be converted into a kind of wisdom to help us in our future. So why should we try again? Why, why, why should we think we're able to do it? Why, what is God saying to Joshua? And every time he tells him to be strong and courageous, he gives him a reason to be strong and courageous. And so we need reasons why to be strong and courageous. It's not just trying to work up some kind of internal courage. There has to be reasons for this. And the first reason is this, is that God keeps his promises. That's what he says, right? You will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors. I promised their ancestors. God is not looking for an excuse to get out of a promise he's made to us. He's not looking for the loophole. He's not saying, you see, you violated the terms of the contract, therefore I'm no longer obligated. That might be business as usual in our, in our culture. It's not the way God deals with us. Secondly, you can learn and grow. That's what he says, right? Meditate on the law that he's given day and night so you may be careful to do everything written in it. That there are some things worth thinking about. There are more important things for us to think about than just rehearsing our failures. That God's word can give us information that leads us to transformation. And this is what's so important. You may be faced with the exact same situation that you failed at previously, but that doesn't mean you're the same person. You can grow. You can learn. You can become stronger. All of those things are possible. And so God wants us to be able to be strong and courageous because we can grow and we can learn. And then the last reason he gives them is because he's always present with us. God is always present. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. In our culture, a lot of times I've got a little um, uh, app on my phone, and I use it when I travel. And yesterday I was coming back from Pittsburgh. You all know why I go to Pittsburgh, right? <laughs> yes, it's because I am now a pop-pop, and that's how I go to see the, the, little, the little creation that made a pop-pop out of me. And uh, so I'm coming back, and, and my my app on my phone directed me off of the thruway. And I don't want to go off the thruway. 
I like going the speed of the thruway. I don't want to be on the back road, so I just stayed on the thruway. That was a mistake. <laughs> because the app knew that on the thruway there was an accident and the traffic was backed up for over three miles, stopped, because there was a semi-trailer that exploded into flames. I was moving so slowly that when I eventually got there, I could take pictures of it. And I thought that, well, I don't want to be off the throughway. My app knew something I didn't. So as I was getting close to Buffalo on my way home, the app says, you need to reroute off the throughway. Guess what I did? For those of you who think I stayed on the throughway, you misunderstand me. <laughs> I got off. I don't know what was on the throughway. I don't want to find out. Do you know what we try to do? We try to determine what our next steps are. And that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to be obedient to the next steps God gives us. He gives us direction. He gives us instruction. We need to pay attention to that. And then he says, I will be with you. We need to be certain of that. And this is what's interesting. He says, I will be with you wherever you go. He didn't say, I will be with you as long as you stay in the places you're supposed to stay and do the things you're supposed to do. I will be with you at certain times or certain seasons or certain places. No, wherever you go. He says, when you're in battle, I'll be there. When you're in planning session, I'll be there. When you're with your family, I'll be there. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're doing, God will be there. I wonder how many of our decisions would be altered and how much courage we could find if we actually believed that God was with us wherever we go. Maybe you'd be interested in actually having the conversation you're trying to avoid if you really believed that God was present. Or maybe you would consider an option that usually would be off the table, but because God is present, maybe something is possible that wasn't possible before. Or maybe an act of generosity. If God's really present, how might that influence how we respond? And that makes a huge difference. Now, we don't get to decide in this life whether we experience pain. Everyone in this room has already experienced pain. And I have bad news for you. Unless this is your last moment in life, there's more pain coming. And, and some of you are sitting there going, I know, Pastor, your message is killing me right now. And, <laughs> and, and you should know I'm only halfway through. So <laughs> Joshua had experienced pain. Well, we don't think about this because we only read the parts of the story that we want to hear. His leader was Moses, and they'd had a close relationship for over 40 years. And that leader is gone, absent from his life now. On top of that, he'd had an experience where he attempted to influence an entire nation to make a better choice, and they failed. And that memory is not something that you easily let go of. On top of that, everyone in his age group, with the exception of one person, had died. You know, when you're younger, you just think you're going to live forever and so will all your friends. But as you begin to age out a little bit, what you discover is, is that sometimes there are people who you love dearly who precede you in death. And it's hard. It's hard to recover from those things. You go to pick up the phone and you realize you can't call them. The standing appointments, the, the vacation times, that's no longer going to be part of your schedule. And it brings a kind of heaviness, a sadness, a lack of enthusiasm to life. That's a form of pain. And we don't get to decide whether we experience pain in life. You're going, it's part of being human. Pain comes in this world. What we do get to decide is whether we process that pain in a way that makes us better or process it in a way that makes us bitter. That's what our choice is. And pain will not make you bitter unless that's what you choose. And so Joshua's in that moment. He can, he can become a bitter person. I've lost my leader. I've lost my friends. I had an opportunity. It didn't work out the way I wanted. I'm going to sit this one out. And he makes a different choice. He makes a choice that's a resilient choice, a choice that allows a different set of options than what he's known so far in his life. So you get to choose whether you will live life based on your regrets or on your convictions. What's going to be the decider of your life? 
Fear that it could happen again or faith that it could be different? That's the options that we're faced with. So you're going to experience adversity. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have disappointments. But that doesn't mean that that's your destiny. It just means that there's something that is happening in your life that you can process in a way that you learn from. Now, you don't develop a resilient life by accident. You have to be pretty intentional about this. There's some habits that is helpful to build into your life. There's a way to leverage your strength and your abilities so that when these moments come, you have options to exercise. So when you're being intentional about becoming a resilient person, when you do that, you'll notice some things. The first is, you don't have to develop the dangerous character trait of constantly quitting, just giving up. Um, I'm a sports fan, so, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm not good at any sport. But aren't you grateful that you don't have to be good at something to be a fan? And uh, from my position in the chair, uh, I actually occasionally make recommendations to the TV screen about an option they could exercise. <laughs> and uh, because in my mind, in my, in my delusion, I, my idea might be better than theirs. And that's very, very safe when I'm sitting in my chair in my living room and nobody can hear me except my wife. And she occasionally just shakes her head. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear that, somebody said, go Bills. <laughs> so we're talking about the dangerous character trait of always quitting, and someone says, go Bills. What does that tell you? All right. So I could end the service right now. Do you want to be a Buffalo Bill for the rest of your life? You know? the, answer is, the answer is, we're hopeful for better things. There's just a habit we can get into where we just give up. And we give in. And the most terrifying thing is, is that sometimes we can add religious language to it and pretend like we're just letting God's will be done. It wasn't God's will that people wandered for 40 years, and he didn't stop providing for them when he did, and he was patient with the next generation until they were able to step into it. But please, please, don't attach religious spiritual language to your bailing out. God won't bail on you, but that doesn't mean he's thrilled with the idea that you're bailing on him. People just quit a lot today. They, they quit on their friendships. They, they quit on their abilities. You know, uh, I, if, if you're getting a driver's test, from what I understand, a lot of people are going to fail that first effort. Does that mean you should not drive? Well, not yet. <laughs> but take the test again. Try again, try again. Why? Because we do grow, we do learn, we do get better. That's, that's kind of the point. So we don't want to give place to that dangerous character trait. And you actually experience more satisfaction. When you don't give up, you experience more satisfaction. Please understand there's a difference between enjoyment and satisfaction. Our culture pursues enjoyment. What I can tell you is, is that if you've ever done anything significant in your life, it's better than any movie you will ever see or concert you will ever hear. That's not to say those things aren't enjoyable, but it will mean more to you. It's more significant. And there's a kind of satisfaction. I enjoy a really good meal. I can tell you the five best meals I ever had and where they were and what I ate. Uh, but I didn't make them. And there are some people who can make that kind of food. That has to be satisfying. And our culture pursues enjoyment over satisfaction. And it can lead us to quit a lot. But God wants us to experience fulfillment and satisfaction of having seen something through. And then lastly, don't settle for lesser priorities. Don't settle for lesser priorities. Joshua could have decided that his entire leadership genre was just simply going to be to keep the younger generation safe in the wilderness. And they could have wandered another 40 years. But he made a different choice. His, his goal was not just to play it safe or keep people alive. His, jo his, his job, his priority, was to move people into the promises of God and let them experience them for themselves. It's a very different agenda. 
And as a result, he makes a different decision. Now, Scripture is filled with stories of people who play it both ways. You have people who do the resilient thing, and then you have people who don't do the resilient thing. And we can learn from successes as well as failures. But here's what I want you to see. A lot of times we think about resilience and, and we use a phrase. The phrase we use is bounce back. Resilient people are people who bounce back. I actually don't think they do bounce back. I think resilience is not about bouncing back. It's about moving forward. Joshua isn't going to be the same guy he was 40 years ago. He's not going to have the same view of the world. He's not going to have the same energy. He's not going to have the same perspectives. His experiences kind of ground some reality into him, but it doesn't paralyze him where he is. Sometimes we think we can't move forward unless we feel like we used to. You're never going to feel like you used to. Just get used to that. How many here have ever heard someone say, after, it's, after not seeing you for years, they say, you haven't changed a bit. It's not true. You've changed a lot. And unless you're under 20 years old, the changes have not been for the better. It's just, I've had, I have people come up to me and say, oh, Pastor Bob, you haven't changed a bit. I go, oh, yes, I have. I've seen pictures. I can tell the difference. And then usually I tell them, you need to see your optometrist because clearly <laughs> something is wrong there. That is not working for you. Move forward, not bounce back. You will experience, you live long enough, you experience a lot of pain in your life. A friend of mine lost his wife for 40 years. Go ahead and tell him he's supposed to bounce back from that. Or the parent who's lost a child or the company that downsized and every ambition, hope, and dream that somebody devoted themselves to for decades of their life is gone. Just gone. And we want to feel the same way. That's not what God is after. He's not trying to make us what we used to be. He wants to make us what he's going, what we're going to be. He's going to move us in that direction. And your failure and your pain doesn't change the trajectory of God. Just keep following him. Keep moving forward and watch what he does with our decisions when we trust him. We don't bounce back. We move forward. Joshua isn't going to feel the way he did 40 years ago. But he is going to lead people into a promised land. Probably our best example and greatest hope of this is actually in Jesus. There comes this moment after the Garden of Gethsemane and after he's been beaten and whipped beyond belief. You, you talk about pain. I don't think any of us would be able to keep our gaze on what he went through. And they force him to carry his cross. And he stumbles underneath the load. He falls to the ground. And this is what I love about Jesus. He doesn't make an assumption. He makes a decision. When you feel like you don't have enough to go, a lot of times we make assumptions about ourselves or assumptions about God. And he didn't do either one of those things. He made a decision. I'll take the step I can with the strength I have and watch what God does with it. And the result of that brings every one of us into God's family. What could happen in our world is if we stop making assumptions when we don't live up to our own expectations and we make a decision that even if I didn't get it right last time, the last time is not the last time and God will give me another opportunity and next time could look a lot different because he's with me, because he's made promises and because I can grow and learn. Let's bow our heads this morning. This is not a talk about things you can't control. Um, there, are, there are marriages where one person just walks away. And this is not a talk about that. There are things we have to process and accept that are true. That's painful. And so this isn't a talk about what you can't control. It's not a talk about how you can get what you want in life. 
It's to talk about that God's not done with you, and if you will dare to take a step of faith today, you'll be surprised where he takes you tomorrow. And that we actually don't have to live in fear of loss or pain or disappointment or discouragement or any of those things. Because while they hurt and they're heavy and they slow us down and wear us out, that there's someone who's greater than all of those things and he's with us and he's in us. That's what God wants you to hear today. It doesn't matter where you are on the age scale. It doesn't matter how long you've lived or how much you've been through. What matters is that God's future for you is better than anything you've seen to this point if you'll trust him. So hear what God said to Joshua, and today I say it to you. Be strong. Be courageous. God is with you. He will fulfill his promise to you. You need not fear. If you didn't have enough the last time something went the way you wished it hadn't, you have grown. You are stronger. The next time can be different. Father, help us lean into and trust that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning.